These are uncertain times for the country's fishing communities. Many have been going to sea for decades, but the fishing rights allocation process, long mired in controversy, shows little sign of improving. In fact, say the tuna pole fishers in Cape Town's Hout Bay, it might just be getting even more shambolic. Claire spent a day at the harbour trying to figure out what went wrong. It's an ungodly hour to be offloading these yellowfin tuna. But the next flight to Spain is just hours away, and the fresh tuna market is thriving. This is the hard face of fishing. It's four o'clock in the morning, and these men have been out at sea for the last five days, hauling massive tuna out of the ocean by hand, but their livelihood hangs in the balance. It's the height of tuna season, and they need to spend every possible day at sea before the tuna migrate, leaving our waters around June. Mike Smith is chair of the Large Pelagic and SMME Association. 25 years ago, I couldn't give this fish away. We used to sell it for three rand a kilo. Uh, thanks to, to a lot of the cooking channels. I don't know if you remember, there was a guy called Floyd, who always yes, used to have Floyd well, with his glass of wine. Now their problem is the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment, who regulate the industry. They decide who can and cannot fish and how much, known as the Fishing Rights Application Process, or FRAP, and it's always highly contested. Let's talk about the rights allocation process. It seems like the tuna pole sector has been hardest hit. You're 100% right. The people who should be offloading fish today are, are tied up and unable to work. And, and we don't know how long it's going to take before they can get back to sea. Nine sectors within the commercial fishing industry have been reallocated. Big companies like Oceana and INJ are in Hake and Deep Sea Troll. The smaller players are in Tuna Pole, running their own businesses with small crews. Walter has been fishing since he was 12, taught by his uncles. He's paying off a 7 million rand boat and is exactly the kind of person the department said they wanted to create access for. He applied for a tuna pole right for the first time this year. Walter's family had been fishing for other people for generations, but this year was supposed to be different. He was hoping to get fishing rights so that he could make real money and be the master of his own destiny. But despite his investment, he was unsuccessful. What did that feel like? Oh, it felt like my whole world was coming down on me, still coming down on me because I need to pay this vessel. If I don't get on sea in the next year, month or two, I'm going to be screwed. I can lose everything. This is the equivalent of high stakes gambling in the fishing industry. Rights have just been allocated for the next 15 years. Companies have spent millions investing in new boats in the hopes of landing lucrative quotas, but the entire process has been mired in controversy. Most graphically illustrated here. How did a boat like this that hasn't been out to sea in years get a tuna right? And it's not the only example, there are many. Did the department apply its mind or are there other issues at play? Why are 70% of the working tuna pole boats denied rights? So when last were you out to sea? When last did you go out fishing? A month and a half ago are and you I'm itching? dying are you inside. Climb? I was about to say, you're climbing the walls. <laughs> if I see another red robot, I'm gonna drive it over with my old rusty bucky. Gary Kingman, viewed as one of the top tuna pole fishermen, legendary for going out to sea in extreme weather with 18 men on board, was denied a right. What has the process been like? Uh, it's been an absolute nightmare. It doesn't make any sense to us because as fishermen, we catch fish and the more fish you catch, the better fishermen you are, but we don't seem to be scored on that in any way. It's got more to do with a whole lot of like, different factors that industry has imposed on us. And it doesn't really make sense in our world. Rights allocation is a lengthy technical process that should have begun in 2018 and awarded in 2020. But after countless delays, the process only started in October last year. And when this rights allocation process came out, they were trying to rush everything to get it finished by the end of last year. We knew the department would never get it right in the time period, but they keep just saying, you have to get it done, you have to get it done. This happens every single rights allocation process. We don't move forward, we don't learn from years past, 
we're actually getting worse each time around. And for the first time, it was done entirely online, but it appears it wasn't tested before it went live. The forms kept changing right up until the closing date. Data and applications entered went missing. People who had registered were simply not on the system. The questions were so complex and inappropriate for the majority of applicants, says Shaheen Muller. The online system just failed. Um, it was introduced in, in, in a matter of days without any pre-planning, no consultation with industry, not a single right holder knew what to expect uh, when this process came live, did not perhaps prejudice a large corporation um, with the resources, but it, it harmed our traditional line fishers who just could not work this complicated IT system. Also, wasn't it in, insecure, like information that was loaded could be viewed by other people? I've got video evidence of me using my client's credentials and login passwords and landing on a third party's um, application, which I could have amended, um, you know, deleted information, etc., uh, at will. And we don't know who did that or who suffered those consequences. Walter couldn't afford lawyers at 100,000 Rand to fill in his application. Most of that question on that thing was really, for me, it was hectic. I mean, we had endless nights of not sleeping because we were worried, what if we don't get in there, we didn't get anything. We were struggling with stuff. So the rights were then allocated in 28 days. How many applications were needed to be assessed and was that a realistic number? 2,800 applications uh, were actually received across the nine fishing sectors. There was no way that the, uh, a human being could have conceivably received evaluated, scored, and made decisions on those numbers of applications in that time frame. The department acknowledged what they called glitches and after an outcry from the fishermen, extended the deadline. Then said an independent observer deemed the process free, fair, and transparent. Some fishermen feel otherwise. How did most of the tuna rights get awarded to new people who don't even have boats in Cape Town where tuna are caught from? New entrants into the fishery appear to be, at face value, just pure paper quota holders. So they don't have the means to, to operate, uh, they don't have the vessels, they don't have the knowledge, and rights were now starting to be traded very quickly. As an example, in 24 hours, one person with a telephone, managed to find 21 different fishing rights that he could operate on. It, it started to highlight something that the department has actually tried and professed to wanting to get rid of. Allegations of corruption and fronting abound. Rights holders sit back and rake in the money from the fishermen who have to pay them per kilo of fish they catch. Yet they still carry the hard costs of repairs, new boats and crew. How come the guy get next door to me who hasn't even been to sea gets allocated a quota? It's literally taken the fishermen out of fishing, you know. That's a, a gross mismanagement and injustice to the fishermen and the communities themselves. It's management decisions like they can fish for nearly two years on a permit extension while the department gets their house in order and then suddenly at the height of tuna season they must stop. A decent exemption over a reasonable, literally an exemption till the end of 2022 would have given this whole frap process time to sort itself out and there would have been no disruption to, to industry at all. You know, no jobs lost. It sounds like the department doesn't really understand the nuances of this industry. Sadly, I don't think they, they have the vaguest idea how the industry operates. Management at, at, at senior level at DAF, that is, is, is one of our biggest challenges. We asked the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment for an interview in February, but they declined, stating that the rights allocation process was still underway. Now that the rights have been allocated, they said the appeal process has begun and anyone who is dissatisfied has until the 29th of May 2022 to appeal. And historically, that outcome takes years. What is the feeling now with your clients um, in this appeal process? There are some decisions that are appealable. Um, the ones that are just blatantly exclusionary, just unlawful. On the other hand, there are those 
applications and those uh, unfortunately outnumber the appealable ones. This is the end of the line for them if we don't go to court. Walter feels broken. He's back working other people's permits, paying them for every kilo of fish he catches. But for 15 years from now, what age am I going to be to apply again for a permit? Almost 60 years old to work for someone again. I don't want to go work for someone again. Thank you for watching our stories here online and please subscribe below to become part of our YouTube community and be notified when we upload our latest content.